Well, thank you so much, Denise. Um, I, I can't tell you um, how much I appreciate Denise's leadership. Uh, she's from Wisconsin. My whole family's from Wisconsin, and uh, you should be very, very proud to have such a great national commander. And uh, Daniel Wheeler, thank you very much, and uh, all of your leadership. I can't tell you how impressed I am with the Legion. I particularly wanted to just give a, a particular thank you and shout out to uh, Verna Jones, who is just a fantastic leader, represents you so well, and Lou Celli, who also represents you here in Washington in such a great way. It makes the Legion very, very strong. I always start out with our mission at VA, uh, something that Abraham Lincoln talked about a week before his second inaugural address, which is his commitment that he believed that the country owed to all of our veterans, those who defended our country, and it's something that every day we wake up and think about at VA, and we live by this motto to care for him who have borne the battle. Of course, today, him or her have borne the battle. Um, and I want to thank the American Legion and all of you, uh, those who have traveled from far and abroad to be here in Washington to advocate for our veterans. Without the American Legion's support, we would not be having the type of progress that we've been making at VA. Uh, the Appeals Modernization Act, uh, which had been last changed significantly in 1933, it was really because of American Legion support that we've made that progress. We're working hard now with the American Legion support on changing and improving our choice program. Uh, our recent mental health executive order, which the president signed, will allow every uh, discharged service member to have a mental health benefit. You've been working with us on our disabilities forms, uh, and throughout you've been really there each step along the way. Um, as Denise said and Chairman Rowe also talked about, this has been a pretty good year in terms of making progress for veterans. We've recently established a uh, first time ever a family caregivers advisory committee to help change the way that we're doing business at VA. And we're so fortunate that Senator Elizabeth Dole has agreed to chair that. We launched the White House hotline that the president talked about in the campaign. It's a 24 seven hotline so we can hear directly from veterans answering thousands of calls a month. The GI Bill, which has been mentioned before, our accountability legislation, um, making sure that the choice program has been funded and, and funded adequately as we've done now on two different legislative occasions, expanding our coverage for those that are other than honorable and launching a national ID card. So those are just some of the accomplishments. I wanted to talk to you about um, five of the most significant priorities that I have for VA and where I'm going to continue to focus our attention. Uh, the first, and maybe the most important, is to design the VA to give veterans greater choice about where and how they get their services and care. And this is really making sure that our system is modernizing and transforming to meet your needs. Um, so what we're going to be doing is working to um, make sure that you have the ability to get care in the VA that is strong and really working well for you, but when you need to, to be able to get care outside the community when that's in the veteran's best interest. And so what we're working on now through legislation is to expand the ability to give veterans more choice eliminate the administrative rules so that right now you have to be 40 miles away or wait 30 days to be able to get access in the community. We want to change that to be more clinically based, so allowing veterans to have access to walk-in care right in their communities, allowing them if they have urgent care needs and they're not being met by the VA that they have immediate access to care. Uh, being able to get simple things like routine labs and flu shots and x-rays closer in their community so you don't have to drive miles and miles. Uh, and wherever there is a VA where the care quality is not up to standards, uh, and we're going to work hard to fix that, but wherever there is that situation where the quality may not be up to the community standards, you shouldn't be locked into a system that's not working for you. That would be 
ability to seek care in the community. So we're working hard to make this a system that works better for veterans and gives them more choice. The second of the five priorities is to modernize the VA. Uh, as you know, this is a system that's been around a long time and in many cases has, has had years and years of neglect. Denise talked about our fact of that we're replacing our electronic health record with a new modern system, but it's the same system that the Department of Defense uses. And for at least 17 years, there have been calls by Congress and billions of dollars spent trying to get these systems to work together, and they just simply don't work together because they're two separate systems. So we're gonna go to the same system as the Department of Defense. So from the time you enlist, <laughs> thank you, thank you. From the very time that you enlist all the way through uh, end of life, if that's what you choose, there will be a single system with all of your records, all your information, and it will be maintained uh, in a way where it will be updated uh, on a regular basis because it's being run by one of the large electronic health record companies across the country. We're also going to be modernizing our system uh, through improving our management practices. This is a book that we just published called Best Care Everywhere. We've taken the very best practices that we've seen across the VA and making sure that everybody across the country is aware of them. That's what modern systems do. They learn from where things are working best and they spread them throughout the rest of their company or their system. And so using this type of strategy of having a diffusion of best practices, we're modernizing our system. We also want all of our facilities to start to be updated and to be modern. This is the Palo Alto VA. This is one of our rooms there, all single rooms, uh, places where family members can stay overnight with their loved ones if they want. Uh, this is the type of facility that we believe all veterans deserve and we're well on our way now to moving towards single rooms and updating our facilities. One of the ways that we're doing that is by, um, just trying to say I may need some help in advancing the slides, okay, uh, is by eliminating or disposing of buildings that are vacant or underutilized. There's no sense in heating and maintaining buildings and spending money on places where veterans don't really get their services or care in. So I've announced that we're gonna be eliminating or disposing of 1,200 vacant or underutilized facilities. And the new infrastructure bill that you've heard the president talk about recently allows VA to take those proceeds and reinvest them into our current facilities. And that will be another way, as Chairman Rowe talked about, of our facilities assessment and making sure that we are investing back into those facilities that veterans are using to get them to be modern. The third of the fifth priorities is to improve the timeliness of our services. Currently now, 96% of all of our appointments are done within 30 days. About 85% of our appointments are done within seven days and 20 something percent of our appointments are done on a same day basis. Uh, that's a, a lot of progress since where we were in 2014. Most important is, is that we have same day services in primary care and mental health in every one of our facilities. So if you have an urgent medical or emotional issue, you will get same day resolution of those services at any one of our facilities. And that's something to assure that we never get into the situation that we had back in Phoenix. One of our important moves that we made is to publicly post our wait times. We are the only health system in the country, there is no other that publicly posts its wait time. So if you want to see the wait time for your appointment at your local VA, just go to our website. It's updated every two weeks and you'll have an opportunity to see whether you think you want to be able to wait that long or whether there's a facility somewhere else close by that you can get faster care at. But uh, pretty easy to use website and uh, we want others to use it. When we do look at whether the VA is doing better than the private sector, and all of you who've gone out to try to get doctor's appointments on your own know sometimes that's challenging. The VA is actually better on average, not in every location, of course, but on average, better than what you would find in the private sector, often 40% better in terms of wait times than you would have to do if you went out to find appointments on your own. 
This doesn't mean that we don't have work to do, that we're not continuing to try to shorten our wait times. We are working on that hard, but, um, but it gives you a perspective. One of the ways that we are providing access to care, particularly in rural areas, is using telehealth. No other system in the country has a telehealth system like the VA. We invest over a billion dollars a year in this. 750,000 veterans get their care using telehealth. I still practice, I'm an in, internal medicine specialist. I practice in two locations, in person in New York City, and from my office in Washington, I take care of patients in Grants Pass, Oregon. You can see at the White House here, I'm showing the president, my patient, uh, who's there in, in Grants Pass, and my clinical team who's there, and we're talking to my patient as I'm taking care of him that day, and I'm showing the president how we use telehealth technology to care for our veterans. We're also working on the timeliness of disability claims. Uh, many of you know, and the American Legion is very involved in this, not too long ago we had over 611,000 disability claims more than 125 days uh, in waiting. Today we have about 75,000, and by the end of the year we'll have less than 50,000 uh, claims more than 125 days. But even more important, we're redesigning our systems. We're using a new system called the Decision Ready Claim where if veterans choose to use that option, we will be able to get them an answer in 30 days or less. And increasingly, again, working with the American Legion, we are finding ways to make that system work better because we want to get those claims resolved and get answers and benefits to our veterans as soon as we can. We had talked about appeals modernization. As you remember, it was at your convention that in Reno that the president was there signing this. It was an exciting day. I'm sure many of you were there. Uh, but take a look at how that's helping. This year, the veterans, uh, the Board of Veteran Appeals is on target to do 81,000 decisions. That's about 25,000 more than last year. And every day we're seeing advances as people begin to start opting into this new process called RAMP of being able to get decisions quicker. Instead of waiting six years, we're able to resolve these and just really a matter of uh, weeks. And so we're gonna continue to work at this. Thank you. We, <laughs> we, um, we have a lot of work to do. We have 450,000 appeals and claims and backlogs. So, so we are really focused on getting this done. This has been something, if we didn't have your support in getting this law changed and in getting the resources we needed, uh, the situation was just continuing to get worse every year. But now I think we're headed on the right path. The fourth of the fifth priorities is to really focus the resources that we have on things that matter the most to you, that matter the most to veterans, that VA has to be world class at, that needs to be better than anybody. And these are things like traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress, spinal cord injury, prosthetics and orthotics, blind rehabilitation, uh, the environmental aspects of war. And uh, these, this is really where VA is now focusing its efforts to make sure that it's world class. The way that we're doing that is we're again publicly showing our quality in these services. So you can see where VA is in terms of specific quality metrics versus what you see in the private sector. And our objective is, is to be the best in the world at these types of services. And we'll continue to show you how we're performing uh, just by going to our website. We're also focusing our resources on things that we think matter to veterans. As you know, veterans have a higher incidence of hepatitis C than the general population. About 18 months ago, we had close to 160,000 veterans who had hepatitis C. We started focusing on that, calling our veterans who we saw had this in their blood, bringing them in, and now using drugs that have more than a 95% cure rate. We will soon, in the next couple months, be at 20,000, so from 160,000 to 20,000, and we are committed to being the first system in the country to eliminating hepatitis C from an entire population. So, <laughs> other, other things that we know matter to veterans, the opioid crisis. Um, VA has been working on this with, uh, with all of you for the last five years, we've seen about a 46% decrease in the use of opioids. 
but we are now posting our opioid rates publicly. Uh, no other system in the country is doing this. We are the first. You can see in any location in the country where, what your opioid prescribing rate is at your facility, and you can see where we have a challenge and where we've made really significant progress. We're not taking away opioids from people who need them. I want you to understand that. 90% of the progress that we've made is not starting veterans on opioids, but instead giving them alternatives, giving them choices about how to deal with pain and how to manage rather than reaching first for opioids. And by doing that and by working together with the doctor and the veteran, we're doing things that I think the rest of the country uh, is learning from and seeing how we can really make a difference and not get people addicted to these medications. The fifth and final priority, the only clinical priority that I talk about is suicide prevention. 20 veterans a day taking their life from suicide. Uh, it's a number that is just staggering and completely unacceptable. And so we focused uh, our resources on trying to get this number down. Uh, if you take a look at this slide, I think it shows really an interesting point, and particularly for those who do talk about the privatization of VA. Over the last 15 years, you can see that veterans who have utilized the VA, the rate of suicide over those last 15 years have gone up by 5.4%. But take a look at the veterans on the right-hand column, those same veterans over the past 15 years who have not used VA services, their rate went up 38.4%. And if you take a look at the very bottom with women veterans, this is even more significant. Those that over the last 15 years used VA services, their rate actually declined in terms of suicide. But compared to the women veterans that did not use VA services, their rate went up over 80%. So this really shows that connecting people with the right services, the right help, saves lives. And this is one of the reasons why we're fearful in a privatization. We just send everybody out into the community where access is even more limited and they may not get the right care. Now what we're doing is we are working very hard to work with community members that if they see people that are isolated, depressed, hopeless, that are at risk for suicide, to get them connected to get help in the VA system. We have a national campaign called hashtag be there or be there for veterans.com. Tom Hanks is our national spokesperson. We have public service announcements throughout the country to try to connect people uh, who may need help back with help in the VA system. The president recently signed a new executive order. Only 40% of active service members who leave the military today are eligible for VA services. But thanks to the president's leadership here, 100% of service members who leave the military will have access to mental health services for, their, for a 12-month period, which is the highest risk period for suicide that we know of today. So that will start. Thank you. And of course, uh, decreasing veteran homelessness. We desperately are seeking an end to veteran homelessness. We've seen close to a 50% reduction but that means that there still are 45,000 homeless veterans in this country. We know homelessness is a risk for suicide when you don't have a stability in your life and you don't have a place that you feel safe that that increases the risk of suicide. So this is very much linked to our priority. We've recently expanded mental health coverage for those with other than honorable discharges. As you know, 15% of veterans leave the military with an other than honorable discharge. Not a dishonorable discharge, but a other than honorable discharge that may have been actually linked to a behavioral issue uh, due to some of the stressors experienced during the military. So this is a group that's at higher risk for suicide. That's why we've done that as well. Finally, let me just mention that this uh, president's budget that you're gonna be talking about and testifying on, uh, we think is a very strong budget. It shows the president's commitment to veterans, this is something that I know when I speak to him on, he's very passionate about, wants to really make sure that he's honoring his commitment to all of you. Uh, and this is a budget that invests back into the VA, at the same time allows us to be able to continue the options of care in the community when that's needed. So we feel very good about that. And very finally, let me just mention that we don't have a 
way of tracking our success like a company does. We don't have a stock price. We don't have a Dow Jones Industrial Index. Our way of measuring whether we're doing right is by asking you, uh, asking veterans whether they trust in the VA. Back in 2014 with our crisis, only 46% of veterans said that they trusted the VA. Today that number is about 70% not anywhere near where we want it to be. We're not satisfied. But it, we do see that we are headed in the right direction, and we're going to continue to focus and fight for you and do what's right for veterans in order to make sure that we do earn your trust. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to spend time with you today. Great. Thank you. Thank you.